Yeah, hi folks, Clint Taylor here from the Property Investor Center. Now I'd like to share this interview with you that I recorded last night. So both Chris Peterson and Ryan Smuts of KPM Mortgages interviewed Cameron Bagri, economist. So Cameron has been an economist for more than 20 years now, and for at least a decade, Cameron was the chief economist at the ANZ Bank in New Zealand. So one of New Zealand's largest banks. Okay, he's known as a straight shooter. He doesn't sugarcoat things. He just gets down to business and says things how they are. Um, Chris and Ryan uh, from KPM Mortgages have an extensive knowledge in the property lending, property finance market, as well as the property investment market uh, on a whole. So it's going to be a great interview. There will be a lot of useful insights um, into the New Zealand economy, the New Zealand property market. Um, we're going to be talking about things like inflation, um, the interest rate forecast. Obviously, we've got a rising um, interest rate environment at the moment, coming from historic lows. Um, we're also going to be talking about the uh, situation uh, in the Ukraine with the invasion um, by Russia and what that could possibly um, or how that could possibly affect things globally um, in regards to global finance and outlook on economies and how that could possibly flow on down to New Zealand. So it's going to be a really useful interview. There'll be a heap of information in here. It'll be a little bit heavy going in the middle, but trust me, um, stick right to the end. There's some really um, great information in here that you will be able to, to gain some value out of. All right, so let's get on into it, um, and we'll talk to you again later on at the end. Um, this evening we've got Cameron here, um, who's the Managing Director of Bagri Economics. Um, prior to that, uh, Cameron was actually the Chief Economist of ANZ for um, a bit over a decade. So um, really good to have Cameron back here with us, and thanks a lot for joining us, Cameron, for the second time. Uh, good evening. Well, hopefully my camera's going to turn on, is it? Uh, not on this end just yet. Um, I will hand it over to Chris. Chris is our MD here at KPM, for those who don't know. Um, he's got an extensive history in finance, particularly working a lot with property investors, as many of you are. So I'll, um, I'll hand it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Ryan, and hi, uh, Cameron. Evening. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. I thought uh, what we'd do to, to tonight is get Cameron back. We had him last year, and he was he was fantastic. A lot of questions from you, and, and please uh, feel free to, to fire those through again uh, tonight. Um, as Ryan alluded, we'll probably skim over a few topics, uh, kind of stuff which I suppose we're interested in, because that's a chance to, to ask Cameron the, the things that we, we're looking at in the market. And please, then then um, we'll leave some time at the end for you to, to throw your things in as well. Um, I suppose I would actually like to start, I suppose, with, with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Cameron, obviously, um, with with Russia being one of the largest oil exporters in the world and Ukraine and then Russia together generating 30% of the world's wheat. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff kind of going on there. What, what kind of repercussions do you think we are feeling in New Zealand, are going to continue feeling in, in New Zealand, and, and how is this going to play out over the next little while? Well, before you... You get into Russia and you talk about the Ukraine, I guess you just got to sit back and think about where we were two months ago. And two months ago, before this thing really kicked off, it's pretty clear globally and locally we had an inflation problem. And the inflation problem was a combination of COVID supply side disruptions, an economy locally or globally that is exceeding it's available capacity. Yeah, you know, the Reserve Bank, sorry, the OECD referred to New Zealand as having an uh, having an overheating economy. And so, uh, the economy is overheating. You bring out the interest rate sort of stick, and when you bring out the interest rate stick, it's not asset price and it's not interest rate. Sorry, it's not growth friendly. Now, what we're seeing with the Ukrainian and Russian situation is that it's basically put that supply side shock on steroids. Yeah, so oil prices internationally are now up around $125 a barrel. That's going to add to inflation. It's also going to squeeze disposable incomes. Yeah, Ukraine is a pretty big player, both in regard to industrials, but also in regard to agriculture production. Uh, agriculture production, if you look at Ukraine, yeah, they've got 25% of what's called the world's black soil. Now, the black soil is the good stuff. 
you know, it's the real productive stock. Ukraine's production possibility frontier in agriculture, they can feed about 600 million people. You know, so you take big parts of that out of the global food supply chain and you've got problems on that level as well as thinking about energy. Now, ironically, out of that stuff in the first instance, New Zealand could do pretty well you know, because if the world is short of food, which I think there's going to be more concerns about, you know, we've already seen GDT spike last week. You know, so New Zealand, across an array of commodities, could do pretty well from one side of the ledger. But, of course, we import an awful lot of stuff as well. And yeah, rising oil prices siphon money directly out of people's pockets, and it's going to make life a little bit more prickly for the Reserve Bank in regard to that inflationary story. So we're seeing some banks have come out there at the moment and basically say there could be a 50 basis point move on the table. Now, do I think we're going to get a 50? Um, not with the housing market as it is in my assessment at the moment. I think it'd be a pretty bloody pull to stand up there and start liking a 50 basis point move despite the inflation when you've got the property market pretty clearly moving backwards. Yep. Uh, in regards to, I suppose, what you're just saying, I saw a comment actually from David Kamler from LinkedIn when he actually, he actually alluded to there might be an opportunity with the fact that we've got severe uh, sh you know, shortages in regards to labour. Obviously, there's a fair, fair amount of people wanting to go to Ukraine at the moment. Is there any opportunity there? Actually, I was just talking to someone before. They said, look, from a humanitarian perspective, why don't we do what happened within World War II when New Zealand took a whole lot of people from Poland? Yeah. Now, yeah, and he, he was actually saying, look, yeah, I'm sure the whole lot of people will be prepared to put up their hand and, and house these people and farm them out across New Zealand. Yeah, they've got a pretty strong agricultural base, so I think they'll, they'll slot right into New Zealand's system pretty quickly. But as I sort of pointed out, well, yeah, be ironic if we were pointing up our hands to take people in from around the globe and give them a home and then we've got all these homeless here in New Zealand as well. But yeah, I, I had a lot of sympathy in regard that we should be doing something. We should be doing an awful lot more than what we're doing at the yeah. moment. Um, well, obviously, yeah, things like the, the triple CFA and all that kind of stuff um, a, a little bit later, I suppose kind of going back to, to, to the Russian situation, I'm hearing that the liquidity in the market is, is freezing up a little bit. Uh, talking to a a non-bank funder who's over in Sydney who, who runs a New Zealand firm here there that you know as well. And he was saying that it's definitely a little bit little bit choppy out there at the moment. Um, I noticed also that I think the banks were tapping in, into the funding for lending program more last week than they had been previously as well. How, how do you see that playing out? Are we going to have a bit of a, a liquidity crunch? Well, potentially. And people are drawing a few parallels with what happened within the global financial crisis. Yep. Now... I don't think we're near that stage anywhere near yet in regard to funding pressure. But you know, if you have a look at you know, Russia, there's a pretty big economy around the globe, and if you choke off that economy or the banking system by shutting down the SWIFT system, you know, odds are you're going to see some problems at some stage down the track. I just saw today, haven't McDonald's pulled out? Yep. So one by one, you're starting to see a whole lot of pretty big players around the globe are starting to disappear or you know, or pull back. So yeah, this the, the Russian economy is on tenterhooks in regard to how this thing is going to pan out. Now economically, if you tend to be on your knees, odds are that's going to morph into something that's going to be a little bit potentially financially nasty on, on the other side. Yeah, I mean, how 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 much could things freeze up if uh, Putin starts getting even more volatile than he is at the moment? Well, who knows. Uh, but uh, I guess if I look at you know, Putin, one thing sort of fears me more than anything else, and that's the the, the finger yep. in regard to how this thing could actually pan out. But we're in the, we're in the whole nature here of you know, black swan events. You know, how, how is this thing going to unfold? It's a, it's a massive game of chicken from both sides. And you know, Putin's pretty clearly, you know, he's been pretty clear in regard to don't put the planes in the air. He'll take that as, you know, an act of war. But you've got one hell of a humanitarian and potentially an economic crisis for, for Russia. Look, the, the economy there is going to implode. There's no other way of, of describing it. Um, and I, I found it interesting your comments just before on, on interest rates because it was obviously um, your old Horned ANZ that was coming out this morning, you know, thinking that, that, that 
that there's going to be the 0.5% increases at, at both the next uh, official cash rate reviews. So they're talking about, of course, the OCR going from 1, 1 to 2% over the next 11 weeks. Um, I note that you don't think it's going to go that far, but I also note that, that they've kind of moved the market already. We received an email, I think, about two hours ago uh, with, a, with ANZ already putting up their, their one and two year rates because I think the spot rates have moved a bit, bit uh, over today. Um, where, where do you see kind of rates going, I suppose, in, in, in the short term, and, and then how do you see this plan out? Because uh, there's obviously a lot of inflationary pressure. Um, we've got kind of gas prices going through the roof. Everything seems to be kind of moving up at a rapid rate of knots at the moment. How, how do you, I, I, I complete, would completely agree with what you're saying in regards to the housing market, and we'll talk more about that, because I think there's a bit of, bit of carnage out there at the moment. Um, it's reminding me a little bit of some of the, the stuff we saw happen probably in 2008 when a whole lot of people started to, to fall over. Um, but outside the housing market and stuff like that, we, and, 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 and you know kind of Adrian Noor and how they'll play this out in Wellington, how do you see them handling interest rates? Where I think the end game for this is that the Reserve Bank is going to end up in a very awkward position. Yeah, because I have a look at the inflationary story out there at the moment. The inflationary story has been driven by three basic factors. One is COVID, the one-offs, Ukraine, which you kind of hope in three years is going to settle down. Yeah, so what goes up is going to come down on the other side and, and we'll get a little bit of inflation relief. Uh, the second side is you know, just an economy that's too hot to trot. And the economy's got the mechanisms, the tools to get that under control. It's not going to be friendly for the housing market or the construction cycle, but we've been here before. Uh, the third thing is that there's a whole lot of structural changes that are going on across the economy that I think are going to make it a lot more difficult to get inflation under control. Yeah, we're entering an era of bigger, more active interventionist government. Now, bigger spending budgets are now order of the day. Yeah, the OECD suggested to the government they want, might want to rein in spending. Well, good luck with that. They're, they're not going to do it. The more they spend, the more there's going to be the inflationary impulse. Climate change policy carries cost. Yeah. Yeah, we've got an incredibly low unemployment rate at the moment, which is a sign of success. It's a good thing. It's putting pressure on wages. That's another good thing. What we're not seeing is the productivity growth on the other side. Now, unfortunately, getting inflation down means getting unemployment up, and that's not what you call a, a politically friendly thing that you want to be delivering on, but it's, it's economic reality. But, but what if the great resignation, tightness we're seeing across the labour market, is, is not cyclical? What if it's more structural? You know, there's going to be a persistent shortage of workers for the next 30 years. You know, population ageing. What if we start to see a whole lot of young New Zealanders suddenly decide that we're going to go do that OE as the rest of the global economy is starting to open up? You know, what if we start to see persistent wage pressure coming through the system? Now, I can add a whole lot of other factors that could add to inflation. The retirement factor, if people are now spending as opposed to saving, and so you've got this portion of the population age 65 plus that I don't think you're going to be too sensitive to rising interest rates. They've made so much money in the past couple of years, they've set up their retirement nest egg, they're done now. And they can draw down or they can release equity in the house because they sell up the open properties, they're going into Tauranga and they're set with the excess that they got over between the Tauranga price versus an Auckland price and there's another 150000 a year for the next sort of 10 to 15 years. Now you add all that together and you've got a little bit more of an inflation persistent story. Uh, and, and I think the end game here is that to get inflation back down to 2%, you're talking really big interest rate moves. Now, big interest rate moves are going to buckle, crumble the economy as yep. you process. And I think we're going to end up is that there's going to be a bit of a day of reckoning where they think the economic cost of having 2% inflation is going to be too drastic. So where's the outcome? we probably end up with inflation outcomes over the next five to seven years that's closer to three. Now, that will be a transition that's going to take a little bit of time to embed. But if I think about interest rate pricing at the moment, look, we're 75 basis points into a tightening cycle, and the stuff that I'm seeing on the ground is that the housing market's already starting to buckle. Yep. Yeah, so, so the whole idea that interest rates are going to be going up another couple of percentage points in the next two years, I'm struggling with the moment because I think the economic 
consequences or where the economy sits today, I think it's a lot weaker under the bonnet than what a lot of the, the glossy numbers we saw in 2021 are actually portraying. So far, do you think it's the increase in interest rates or the reduction in capital, the triple CFA and other things which are basically pulling the housing market back? It's a combination. Yeah. Yeah, so if we go back, you know, if you ever look at your loan commitment growth way back in early 2017, your loan commitment growth early 2017 was below 2016. Why? Loan to value ratio restrictions were brought in, I think, October the 1st, 2016. So what are we seeing? Loan to value ratio restrictions are in. Your banks are lifting their test serviceability rates. We've seen a couple of banks applying debt serviceability restrictions. And then you've got to overlay that on the triple CFA. So you see you roll the whole lot of it together and you've got a, a pretty big tightening in credit conditions. But if you look at what we've seen in the past 12 months, look, credit growth is up about 30 billion in the past 12 months. It's up 10%. Now, that's abnormal. You know, $2.5, $2.6 billion a month is bordering on the ridiculous. If we go back and have a look at... Sorry? Normally you expect about $2 billion a month, wouldn't you? Yeah, right? normally you'd expect it. So let's... Let, household lending growth is $330 billion. Yeah. Now, you'd expect that to be grow in line in a normal environment around, say, 6 or let's be generous, 7%. So, you, so you're talking there, 18 to 20, 21 billion is a, is a normal environment. We're currently up around 30. So it's a, irrespective of the triple CFA, credit growth is going to slow back down to that 18 to 21. So I know there's a lot of criticism towards the triple CFA, and a lot of that criticism is warranted because it has it is poor legislation in regards to their intent was fine. The application of it has just been absolutely ridiculous. But stepping aside from the triple CFA, if you want to get inflation under control, you cannot allow credit growth to be growing in excess of income growth. Yeah, that's consistent with inflation, not disinflation. So just disposed to see everyone actually quickly jumping into the triple CFA, you'll have seen all over the news, uh, effectively Chris Farfoy, who was the, the previous Minister of, of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, I suppose proposed this. Um, David Clark has definitely been out there, who's the current, the current Minister. Uh, has has definitely been continuing to push it. Uh, it was designed to suppose, protect vulnerable borrowers. Um, you know everything I, I believe I can I can see in regards to to the finance around New Zealand is that the the amount of borrowers who are actually in through hardship is a is a very very minute fraction of the amount of lending that's out there. Uh, what you've got is from like David Clark and probably various consumer groups is basically making it sound like it's it's wider it's more widespread than what it actually is. Uh, and so we've ended up in the situation that this amendment to the Act has been pushed through. It means that uh, directors and, and potentially senior managers of, of the lending institutions can be liable for, for $200,000 uh, fines if they're seen to be negligent. Uh, and what that's caused, I suppose, is a lot of uh, lenders to suddenly sit there and go, well, we're just going to back off from making uh, calculated judgments, which is, which is how finance and how credit works and that's basically restricting credit uh, through the system. And uh, Centrix, which is basically a, a, a credit reporting agency, uh, kind of came out and they've already basically said, I think recently, that it's disproportionately affecting, um, I suppose, what we call quality borrowers, the people who have got kind of high credit scores are finding it really hard to, to basically kind of get funding at the moment, where this amendment is really kind of stated that it's supposed to protect the, the, other, the other end vulnerable borrowers. So we're seeing across the board what that's doing is pushing people actually to use non-banks more. There's a massive growth in the, in the non-bank sector, and I'm sure you can comment on that that surely, uh, Cameron, because it's actually making what I call um, bank uh, borrowers get pushed towards non-banks and have to pay more for the money. Uh, but it's definitely kind of, I think, going to flick a, a fair few people over as well. Um, you, you'll be seeing all kinds of things behind the scenes. What, what have you seen, I suppose, since the triple CFA came in? or that the amendment came in, I should say? Well, you've seen the immediate reaction from the banks, although the, the, the reaction started before the, the implementation in regard to the behavioural changes. Uh, some of the things that I'm keeping eye on at the moment is, I guess, the unintended consequences of the triple CFA. 
which is just not just the tightening of primary credit into the housing market, but it's the impact of that tightening into the business sector. 100%. As we know, yeah, the, the old house is the implicit financing vehicle for an awful lot of SMEs, and SMEs are out there at the moment getting absolutely whacked by Omicron. And in the last 18 months, I've lent on that equity from a rising housing market, and it's been pretty easy to extract that equity to give themselves working capital within the business. Now you get at the moment the combination of a property market that is turning and application of the triple CFA and all of a sudden that working capital facility that many businesses have been reliant upon, you know, it just disappears overnight. Yeah, so we're entering into a period where there's a cash squeeze taking place across the business sector and their working capital that they would typically access is going to be absent. Yeah, so I've yeah, I've been out there sort of yeah, taught saying the government needs to implement some sort of lending facility. You know, the, the, there's a structural issue that needs addressed here to buy a little bit of time. I find it quite horrific that MB, who's leading the inquiry into the triple CFA, has got no one within that team has got any experience of working for a lending institution. And it's pretty MB, who I understand that who you know, didn't listen to, I suppose, a lot of representatives uh, of lenders, didn't listen to the Financial Service Federation, all that type of stuff, prior to basically putting this in. Are you expecting there to be much of a change from the inquiry that's being undertaken at the moment? Well, I hope so, because you've got a piece of legislation here that was aimed at South Auckland loan sharks and probably a, a bit of the stuff we saw within the motor vehicle industry as well. That's just growing tentacles way beyond what the original intent was. And I saw David Clark came out and had a bit of a crack at the banks and say, well, you must have been irresponsibly lending prior to the triple CFA to have now seen, uh, so I'm just going to try the camera. I actually popped out and I tried to pop back in to reset it. So I don't know what the setting is, but something switched off. Uh, sorry about that. And, and my camera. So where was I? Yeah, the, the, the bank, well, the banks are not in the business of irresponsible lending. Yeah, so if you look at banks box, yeah, bank book of non-performing loans across banks in regard to uh, home lending is 0.2 percent of their total lending book, which is a ridiculously small number. Yeah, so the the steps that the banks were taking through prior systems were actually pretty good. Um, the ludicrous at the moment is just this evidentiary trail that they now need to provide. And it's just taken things to an absolutely ridiculous level in regard to the investigation, the inquiry that needs to take place. Uh, caveat, to be fair, banks should be a lot better set up in this space in regard to using technology to do this sort of stuff. Yeah, I So know. banks are not exactly squeaky clean here in regard to what needs to take place. And we all know that bank systems are not what you would call world, world class. Uh, they're, they're patches on patches as opposed to biting the bullet and really fundamentally reinvesting in a, in a system from DOT. But the, the problem is, yeah, that stuff's hellishly expensive. It just seems to me that we've had similar, I suppose, changes implemented in Australia. Uh, my understanding is they're looking to kind of roll some of that back over there because of the adverse effects that it's caused. Uh, and that hasn't even been looked at, I suppose, on this tight side of the Tasman. Surely there should have been some common sense looking over there, go, okay, what's what's been, you know, worked right? what's worked wrong, spend a bit more time rather than just kind of ram it in right towards, you know, I suppose, in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, we're seeing situations where, if I, if I pick on the first home buyer market as an example, they're reading the, the papers and hearing that banks are going to, you know, go through their, each line of their bank statements on a granular, almost forensic level, and are going, well, we want to stop spending. Now, that's obviously going to have a flow-on effect to, to hospitality and all that as well at, at the time where they need people spending money. We've got you. Finally, I <laughs> took a bit of playing around with settings. Yep, we got there. Apologies. Thanks for your patience. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so you, you think we, we will see some changes? Well, we have to see changes. I mean, the positive, I suppose, I can see is if, if there is a positive out of this, is this is probably creating a much stronger non-bank market uh, because we're seeing a lot of entrants come in, in, in there, which I think are a lot more solid than the ones we had back around the GFC. Um, do you see, as that market grows, though, the Reserve Bank, bank wanting to regulate that market more as well? Well, let's have a look at the non-bank 
market at the moment. If you look at yeah, non-banks within the housing arena, yeah, non-banks have got about 1.6% market share. Yeah, so they're so they're tin pot. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit of a flea at the moment that doesn't have an awful lot of size or substance. It's it's nothing like what we saw in 2006, 2007, 2008, where the non-bank sector was pretty pretty chunky. And when you get that sort of chunkiness within that sector, and you don't have the systems in place, you can become a bit of an economic risk, which they very clearly did between 2006, 2007, 2008. And we all sort of know what happened there, where they were donkey deep in every speculative property developer around New Zealand. Now, if I have a look at what's going across the non-bank lending sector at the moment, and the, the last three months, your yeah, non-banks have written, I think, about 7 to 8% of new mortgages. Now, in the month of January, they wrote 10% of new mortgages. So their overall market share is, is really small. But when you start writing 10% of new mortgages that are hitting the market, that's, that's a big chunk. Now, your glass are full. They're actually meeting a need in the market. And what I'm seeing there at the moment is that your banks are being pretty rigid with their black book sort of approach. You know, square pegs get through a square hole. Whereas uh, a lot of these non-banks are starting to think about, well, you, know, you might be a round peg, but we think we can slot you into a square hole. So they're actually working quite constructively with, with clients around the edges. And I think there is a service proposition there. Uh, but like most people, I, yeah, when I start seeing 10% of lending coming through that sector, you start to think about internal controls, credit risks, and that sort of stuff, the juncture we are in the cycle. But as I said yeah, right at the start, the... The sector's got a very small proportion of overall lending, yeah, so it doesn't represent the flag-bearing risk that we've seen before. And to be fair, I think we've seen a lot of, a few old school traditional bankers have left the banking sector and they are working for those non-bank players. Yeah, so, so there's some pretty big structural stories on the ground that give us a little bit of comfort in regard to what's going on. But yeah, the, Encouraging thing is that they just seem to be working a lot more with clients constructively in, in regard to providing solutions. You know, where, where, where the banks have been, I don't know, they've overworked you. All the, you know, all the stuff that banks now need to do in regard to keeping up with the play, in regard to you know, all these courses and you know, compliance, it's just gone, it's taken on a world of its own in regard to, so what does that mean? you just got less... Uh, less time to actually do the right stuff with clients. Yeah, yeah so there's, there's big voids there. Improving the process, improving the end result for clients at all. Yeah. And yeah. You know, the banks have been you know, busy as hell for the past you know, 12 months processing the stuff. And you'll have seen it, but yeah, it's taken a long time. Now, you know, what's going on? We're naturally seeing more players enter, enter, enter into our market. Yeah. The challenge, I think, is going to be in, in six months' time where... Yeah, we get beyond the noise of the triple CFA and things start to sort of calm down, but we realise, well, hang on, we still need to have credit growth around $2 billion a month as opposed to 2.6. Yeah, I mean, in regards to, I think, our stats, we looked at ours for the, the start of 2022, and I think 18% inquiry coming through us was getting, we were looking at non-bank, and I think about 29% of what we've settled so far is going through there. Now, that's probably a higher portion of the market because we're always seeing more developers uh, at the moment, who are having to use non-bank because, of course, the banks are shutting more of that stuff off at the moment. But that seems to be a area where, um, I suppose, if I compare it to what I, what I was seeing prior to the GFC, is that back then we had your, you know, your Petroviches and your Eric Watsons taking money off the public and being quite happy to burn it. Where, as you said before, we've got a lot more experienced people who have probably got more of their own money in the in the pot this time. And what we're seeing is even the non-banks are being a lot more conservative. And, and, and how they're lending, they're pulling back their, their LBRs quite aggressively in regards to what they're willing to lend at the moment. Yeah, the, 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 the sector's got far better internal controls. Is there going to be some bad stuff go wrong at this juncture of the cycle? The answer is yes. Yeah, it always happens when inflation turns up and the interest rate cycle turns, you're going to see a little bit of flushing. And yeah, the anecdotes are pretty widespread in regard to what's happening in some parts of the development market. Uh, you, you can't recycle the cash from the previous pro, uh, project because you haven't completed it. Uh, meanwhile, you've got to settle on the next project. You don't have the cash. You're not getting the pre-sales. 
uh, inflation is making the cost things on those projects look a lot more marginal. Uh, the price of land is easing back as opposed to going up. So the whole economics of a lot of these projects have, have literally flipped in the last three months. I um, spoke to a solicitor today who told me he heard or he he knew personally of a purchaser who was unconditional on 165 different properties. Uh, for the last couple of years, he'd basically just been going unconditional uh, and on selling them prior to settlement, and he's got all of these settlements lined up. And that, that'll be the biggest one I've heard. Uh, but we're definitely starting to see a lot of people who I think went unconditional at certain stages last year, thought they could get resource consent on projects, move it on, make a buck. And it's the old Warren Buffett, I suppose, quite. When the tide starts going out, you start, uh, yeah. who's, who's, start seeing who's swimming naked. And there seems to be a lot of, a lot of naked swimmers at the moment. Yeah, and look, the, the finger's been pointed at people, I oh, can't get finance, is the obvious one. Whereas I think when you strip it back, the you know, project viability is, becomes a lot more questionable when you see this sort of inflationary pressure within the system, and all of a sudden it's pretty obvious that the property cycle is turned down on, on the other side. You know, so the viability, the numbers look fundamentally different. And in regards to that, how do you see that part playing out? Because we've obviously got a lot of supply coming on, uh, but there's also going to be a huge amount of these projects that never go ahead because of lack of credit, uh, the, 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 the pure um, you know, cost of materials, the cost of labour these days. Do you, how do you see the housing market from a, a supply demand go, you know, area in the next couple of years? Are we, are we going to definitely catch up? Are these, a lot of these houses not going to get built? Right, so let, let, let's have a look at it both through a stock and a flow. Sort of. So if I have a look at the, my snapshot at the moment in regard to where New Zealand sits in regard to housing supply, do we still have a shortage? I think the short answer is yes. Do I think that is a big number at the moment? The answer is no. I think Auckland at the moment is moving into a situation where by the back half of this year we'll have more supply relative to demand. I think we've pushed a little a lot of the housing shortages out into the regions. You know, that's where we're seeing a lot of the escalation and the shortage of the social housing waiting list. Uh, Auckland's lost a lot of people in the last three years to what's called intra-regional migration. In fact, that number in the last three years is about 35,000 have left Auckland. So that's equivalent to the entire population of Gisborne packing up and going and living somewhere else. Now those numbers for 2019 and 2000 was, was massaged by net uh, international migration. So Auckland's population was still moving up at a rapid clip. If you look at the last 12 months where you've got natural population growth going up, you've got nobody coming in and you've got a net internal migration outflows, so uh, Auckland's actually suffered a, a net population loss in the last 12 months, and I think that story is going to be more of the same in the next sort of 12 months. So you know, Auckland, I think, is going to end up overbuilding by a substantial margin, and we all know that those building consents are, are running around, I think, 20,000 a year for, for Auckland, 50,000 a year nationally. If I have a look at the flow where we sit at the moment in regard to the housing cycle, uh, the Reserve Bank is assuming that housing supply is going to hold up for the next two years. I don't believe it. Yeah, I think housing supply is going to taper off pretty sharply in 2022. Yeah, I think we peaked the end of last year. And yeah, the bottom line is that you, when you see 15 to 20 percent cost inflation coming into the system, then the, the viability of an awful lot of stuff just goes right out the door. Now, you tighten up the availability of credit. People cannot go back to the bank and get another 15 to 20 percent more debt to fund those projects. In fact, banks at the moment are saying, actually, we're going to offer you 10 to 20 percent less debt than what we pre-approved six months ago. So things are actually going in the other direction. So the bottom line is that one of my concerns at the moment is that the storm we've got at the moment is that we see a little bit of history repeat where the construction cycle goes through a bit of an exaggerated weakening on the other side. And we all know how the, what takes place is that all of a sudden we see a big chunk of people that go to Australia, and that makes the situation actually worse. And then in three to four years' time, we get back into it, and then ironically, tightening the supply lays a platform for another big, bit of a roar on the other side. Now, we sort of hope in a perfect world that it'll be a lot more stable in the Reserve Bank's view of the world where you know, supply just holds up. For some sort of miraculous reason, we still keep on building 50,000 units a year, Maybe it takes a little bit longer because we can't get chipped, that sort of stuff, but we still manage to get them built. I just don't think that's going to take place. 
Yeah, know, the conditions have changed. You, you can't get the product. It feels behind the scenes that we're, you know, in, in different industries, we're about to lose a whole lot of people to Australia. Some of our best and brightest, it just feels like there's a lot of people who are in the, the mood to potentially start looking overseas when these borders open up properly. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, so, so if you have a look at, if we just use Australia as a test case, um, the migration cycle between New Zealand and Australia is typically anything between zero and a loss of 30,000 people. You know, zero is the best that we do. At the moment, we're sitting around zero. The long-term average is around 15,000. Now, you, what you got here in New Zealand at the moment, look, New Zealand still offers some real great attributes in regard to safety, geographical distance. You know, some people call that a disadvantage. It's also a, an advantage having a big moat, this sort of stuff. So New Zealand probably underplayed that in 2020 in regard to what we could have actually sold. So there is a lot of people out there that are just going to want to come home. But of course, yeah, for a lot of people, New Zealand is now waking up to the reality of the enduring impact of COVID. Now, we're the people that are not going to the sporting games. In 2020, we were the ones going to the sporting events. Now the rest of the world is opening up in advance of us. And, you know, they, they, their whole rats antigen testing regimes are a country mile ahead of us in regard to dealing with this stuff on an in, enduring basis. And I think the real danger is that there's a whole portion of society that says, look, you know, just getting a little bit too, bit too tough. I want my mobility. I want my life back. And you got pent up demand because people haven't gone and they just go. And yet, little things that I keep an eye on and you see on worry me a little bit as well. Yeah, you know, it doesn't tend to be a week goes by where you don't see a sh the occurrence of a shooting in Auckland. Yeah, that, that sort of stuff never used to take place as frequently as what we're actually seeing now. Yeah, so once again, New Zealand's got some great attributes. You know, working from home or working from anywhere around the globe is now a reality. Yeah, but odds are, if you're going to play that, well, you're probably going to go down to Queenstown or Hawke's Bay, these sort of places. Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 it, it, I don't think it's going to be the natural inflow where people sort of come and they park themselves in Auckland. They're going to be geographically diverse in regard to what, what goes on. Um, I suppose leading from that into things like politics, how do you see, uh, I suppose, things playing out over the next 18 months? Because obviously we've got some pretty severe headwinds we're going into, as, 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 as you've just mentioned. Luxon, uh, Chris Luxon came out on, on the weekend and is obviously coming out basically saying he's going to roll back uh, a lot of Labor's tax policies if they get in. W what's your opinions on that? Well, let's have a look, look at the political landscape more broadly before we get into tax. Um, and, and the whole political environment has shifted in the last six months. And it shifted for a, for a couple of reasons. Look, one, you've seen a, a leadership spill. Now, that's that Australian word where yeah, they've, they've got a name because it happens so goddamn often. But what's also gone on in New Zealand is that, you know, obviously we're in you know, the second half of the COVID battle. And the second half of the COVID battle is a little bit like that 1999 Test Bank versus, versus the French at Twickenham which didn't go too well for the All Blacks. They had a great first half. The yep. second half wasn't as flash, and we got knocked out. Well, that's been a little bit like New Zealand's COVID response, great first half. And all of a sudden, the second half, we're realising that, yeah, we don't have the ICU capability of the whole stuff with rats. It's just like, yeah, Lord, what, what on earth is going on? Yeah, so there's a bit of a wake-up that's going on. What's also taking place, if you ever look at the Ipsos Issues Monitor, which is a, a server that I keep a track of, sort of the the economic versus the social ledger, and it asks households, what, what's your biggest concern? Now, for the past four years, the biggest concern by a country mile has been housing. It's been top of the pops every quarter, apart from when we went into the first lockdown. And that's for obvious reasons, housing affordability, being able to get on the property ladder, you know, things getting out of whack between the haves and the have-nots. Cost of living, inflation is now issue number one. And now, inflation is a thief that steals your money, and it's no coincidence that the opposition political party now is heading home really hard in regard to inflation and that threat, and they're using the term crisis. Is it a crisis with inflation up around 6 to 7%? I wouldn't put it in the crisis camp, but it hurts, and it's hurting particularly for middle to low income families, and it is forcing the, the Reserve Bank to lift interest rates. So first time buyers, 
that are hooked in in the last sort of 12 months, you know, off the great 2.19% at one year, by the middle of this year, it's going to have a four in front of it for, one, for that one year rate. Now, 4% is still pretty low. 4% is roughly double 2.19. And then we've got, yeah, the, all of a sudden, you, you, you go to roll off onto interest only into P&I. And, and if you don't want to go into P&I, well, you've got to put in a new lending application, which means you're coming under the triple CFA. Yeah, so there's all these things that are going on behind the scenes that are going to make life a, a little bit interesting. But yeah, it's a the next election is a two-horse race. I wouldn't have said that six months ago. And I actually think that's healthy because irrespective of your political leanings, I think New Zealand is stronger when we've got two strong mainstream political parties because we tend to get better policy outcomes overall. Why? because they drive each other to account an awful lot more. And do you think do you think national if they do get in, they will actually honour that and bring the bring bring some of those changes in? Because obviously if, uh, there's a lot of investors on this tonight and these changes to their deductibility on top of the interest rate increases uh, on top of basically, you know, uh, other things going up to inflation are definitely going to uh, are in line to hurt in the next couple of years. Oh, I think that whole policy in regard to removing interest deductibility is, is poor policy. Yeah. So it will, it will get reversed, and it should be reversed. Yeah. There, there is there is no tax advantage for housing. Housing has got a lending advantage. They are fundamentally different. You know? If you want to level the playing field, then sort out the lending advantage. But yeah, don't call a dog a, a dog a cat. Yeah. And say, look, yeah, it's, it's a, it, it is not a tax advantage. They, they've removed that, and it's it's ridiculous tax policy, and it needs sorted. Well, it's flying on to rent increases as well. Um, so just a couple of questions, I suppose, to finish up before on the, on the Reserve Bank, and then we'll throw it out to some questions. Um, going, I suppose, for, to, from mid, mid to late last year, uh, we definitely saw the Reserve Bank starting to talk about regulating those interest rate floors, uh, and then also you know doing some work around debt to incomes. Um, the, the, the test rate floors don't really bother me too much. Debt to incomes scare me a lot. Uh, do you think that those will get implemented or do you think that the market's likely to get, you know, to pull back on its own enough this year that it's not a 2022 issue? Well, you, you hope that the market will do the work that the Reserve Bank is flagging, otherwise the regulator is going to have to step up. Now, there's already two banks out there that are implementing debt service ability restrictions or some shape or form. You know, so we know that those are factors that are tightening up the availability of credit. And that's, you know, but that's really good to see that the lenders are taking responsibility in regard to managing the economic cycle. That's actually a really good thing because the more that the lenders act in a responsible manner, you know, the less heavy-handed the regulator needs to be on the other side. And what we've seen, of course, you know, from you know, over the past you know, decade or so is that LVR restrictions are in, they're out, they're sort of all, all over the place. And when they're in, they tend to be in for a little bit sort of longer as opposed to just being a, a temporary device. Now, yeah, debt serviceability restrictions, I think it will be a lot more effective than loan-to-value ratio restrictions. But yeah, the flip side to those is that you choke off a pretty big portion of the population that you're trying to get on the property ladder. But, yeah, ironically, you know, you're getting on when you've got valuations up around 11 times incomes. You know, you're probably providing a little bit of protection to them. Yeah, I mean, people go broke on, on cash flow. They don't go broke on equity. Uh, so I can definitely understand to an extent having some type of serviceability restriction does make sense. I suppose I've never liked the idea of DTIs being posed you know, across the board uh, as, as one tool because I suppose I look at it and go, they take living expenses into consideration. If I go buy another investment property, I don't take on another set of living expenses. So my understanding is most you know, other countries don't necessarily impose it on, on property investment. They mainly kind of apply it to own occupied, and it seems to me that part there is maybe political as well, that it's another way to try and you know, slow down property investors. Yeah, and it's a question, you know, finding out the, the wrinkles. Look, I wouldn't underestimate the impact of banks adjusting their test, test serviceability rates as well. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, nudging, they're nudging up at the moment. ANZ put it up 0.4% yesterday, Brian. Yeah, but they, they, when those numbers went from around the low sevens to the low sixes, that had a huge impact on the market. Yeah, 100%. It just fundamentally changed the whole borrowing equation literally overnight. 
Now that sort of stuff works in reverse at the moment and there's a whole lot of conjecture out there at the moment in regards to there's this thing we call the neutral official cash rate which is this whole idea well where does the cash rate need to be to have inflation around two percent right and in a normal environment you know, way back 20 years ago we used to think that number was around five to six so if the neutral OCR is around five to six well that means interest rates might move between four to seven to eight which yeah. is what they did and now the neutral official cash rate the reserve bank saying is around two right so interest rates uh, based on might get to sort of five what if the neutral OCR is not two yeah what if it's three what if it's four yeah. now what if there are some structural changes going on across the economy where that neutral official cash rate is not quite as low as what we thought it was and this is where things such as demographic, the baby boomers, now them starting to release capital, them starting to spend, and there was some numbers come out of Stats New Zealand uh, the other week that basically broke down wealth by age cohort. And I think for, from memory, for the 65 plus had net wealth of about 550 billion, and that was as at mid 2021. So as at mid or late 2022, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd put that number up, you know, a wee bit further. Yeah, but now we're starting to come down on the other side. But th th those are big numbers of wealth. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that, that's going to take some reining in. So you're, you're not going to be too price sensitive in regard to paying for the golf clubs or little wonder we got a shortage of, you know, of EV bikes. They just want them. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, thank you very much for that. Um, we need to make sure we've got some time to, to open up some questions. Um, have you some questions coming through, Ryan? And if anyone else has got some questions, start firing those through to Cameron as well. Yeah, we certainly have. Um, I'll, I'll probably start um, with, there's one question here. Um, I think the, the generic sense you definitely have covered, Cameron, but maybe just to go in a little bit more detail. A um, question, where do you see short-term, i.e. 6 and 12 months, fixed interest rates being 12 months from now? higher or lower than what they are now. I think you've answered the latter part of that. Um, but just before you do answer, just so you guys are aware, it looks like, Cameron, you're starting a, um, a bit of subs a subscription on your website for people interested in, um, in mortgage borrowing commentary. So feel free to check out Cameron's website and, um, and sign up to that for the future. Over to you, Ken. So look, yeah. if I have a look at yeah, six month, one year rates, what, what's the trajectory going to be for the next 12 to 18 months? They're going to keep going up. But if I sit back and think about the, the bigger picture in regard to where I think interest rates are going to be in the next three years, you know, do I believe the Reserve Bank is going to be hiking the official cash rate another 200 basis points in the next 24 months? The answer is no. You know, it, it would be incredible if we saw 12 or so OCR increases in New Zealand in a row. We've never seen that before. You know, I actually don't think the economy can could handle that. Yeah, so I actually think the market at the moment, despite the inflationary story, which I think is actually worse than 5.9%, which is the headline as well, you know, I think inflation's already up around 7 So we've got one hell of a battle on our hands. But yeah, there is a limit as to how much I think you'll be prepared to buckle the property market and take interest rates up. Yeah, so I think at the moment the market's pricing in too much. On that, where do you, um, one of the other questions is, where do you see the OCR um, at the end of 2023? Well, I've got a two number in my head as opposed to a three, which is what the market's saying. Um, a little bit earlier, you were talking about uh, interregional migration. Um, one of the questions they've got here, and you did make a, a bit of a note around Auckland, is what are your predictions for the Auckland, uh, Wellington and Christchurch property markets over the next few years? Right, so uh, in order of the biggest underperformer, it's going to be Auckland. Uh, Wellington, the positive is that there's a lot of money coming out of government spending. So yeah, Wellington's got the potential to hold up. The issue with Wellington at the moment that's starting to concern me is that the valuations are starting to get right up there. In fact, they're starting to track a little bit in line with Auckland. Uh, Christchurch is two-tiered. I think Christchurch is going to hold up the best. Uh, why it's just an outright valuation flow. You know, Auckland, sorry not Auckland, Christchurch is some of the least 
unaffordable property in New Zealand. I wouldn't call Christchurch affordable, but it's at the least unaffordable part of the market, and, and it's, it's, it's still a true city. Uh, the caveat that worries me about Christchurch at the moment, there's a lot of supply coming online there as well. There's no shortage of land. Um, another question, we are where we are right now. If you are the government, what will be your top three actions to avoid an economic tailspin? Top three actions. Depends on when you want to you know, think about the tailspin or what you would characterise as a tailspin. So let's, let's think 20 to 30 years out. You know, what, what sort of country do we want New Zealand to be defined as? Now, one of the biggest economic indicators I look at today in regard to where New Zealand is going to be 20 to 30 years out is educational attainment and achievement. What's going on in the schools? If we do not have a strong performing schooling system today and kids regularly turning up to a school, to school, I'll give you an economic tailspin story 30 years out. Not in regard to one discrete year, I'll give you a story in regard to New Zealand is a pretty nasty place to be year after year. So if I start seeing stats such as 60% of kids regularly attend school, now regular attendance is there nine days in 10, so you've got 40% of kids are taking more than one days off a fortnight, I finally see mathematical achievement, attainment, science achievement, we've been deteriorating for a long time. So I look at those sort of things and I'd like to see more of a call to arms in regard to education, but within a long-term lens in regard to where we're going. Now, in the, in the near term, the biggest tailspin challenge we've got at the moment is inflation. Now, what should the government be doing in regard to inflation? Look, one, they should be uh, backing off in regard to spending. The more that they can back off in regard to spending, the easier they're going to make Adrian Noor's job. The more they spend in the 2022 budget, the more that it's going to make Adrian's job a lot more prickly. What they also need to be doing is working out what can we do to make the economy operate a little bit more efficiently, seamlessly, so we can grow a bit faster without creating more inflation. So we've got a low unemployment rate, 3.2%. There's another 40,000 people on a benefit today than what there was pre-COVID. Go figure. We've got rising welfare dependency. Now, if we can get on top of welfare dependency, get more people into paid work, that means we, we can grow faster without generating inflation. Grow faster without generating inflation, hey, presto, interest rates lower than what could be otherwise be the case. Now, there's a whole big other list I could sort of roll out, you know, but you know, I, I think yeah, let's have a, a sort of short-term target, what we need to do, but also think about you know, the long-term and the biggest yeah. barometer where we're going to be is education. Thank you. Um, we've got another one just in the difference of, of I suppose, cost of funds. Um, banks have increased home loans quite a lot since um, 2021. However, during the same period, the interest rates that non-banks um, have raised by are not as much compared with that. Um, of course, they have different funding strategies, but do banks really have such a huge increase in cost of funding at the moment with the cash rate going from about 0.25 to where it is now? No, uh, bank margins uh, on the expansion trial. So you go have a look at the, yeah, the Reserve Bank dashboard and you can see that pretty clearly in regard to what's going on. You know, if you look at the, the old split in regard to bank funding, if we look at uh, local based funding, look at ignore offshore funding. So, so bank funding used to be basically 50% term deposits, 25% savings accounts and 25% transaction accounts. Now, Obviously, term deposit rates came down, and we saw borrowing rates move down in line with that. But the split of bank funding changed from 25, 25, 50 to 30, 30, 40. So 30% was coming from transaction account, and you get zero on that. 30% was coming from savings account, and you basically get a big donut on that. And 40% was coming from term deposits. Now, term deposit rates have moved up. Right, so banks are competing a lot more furiously for term deposit, but it's still 40% of their book as opposed to 50% of their funding. Now, so you, you haven't seen savings rates rocket up anywhere near like what they they, they came down. Yeah, so banks have still got oodles of cheap funding up there. They're, they're accessing the funding for lending program. Yes, 
the cost of some of the offshore funding is is going up. But yeah, what, what we're seeing is, look, banks, I think, are pricing away some lending. They don't want to write a four- or five-year mortgage. Why? Because it doesn't match their funding profile. Yeah, so yeah, as soon as we started to see late 2000 and, yeah, 2020, early 2021, when the curve started to sort of move up and people started to chase down that 299, they priced it away. And then people jumped into the three-year rate and they sort of priced that away as well. And so now people are looking at the choice between the one and the two year. Am I incorrect? Is, is it this sometime this year the banks are supposed to be holding more capital? I vaguely remember that it was last year or something like that. Did, did, didn't the, because of COVID, didn't that get put off for a period of time? And is it this year that comes in, some of those requirements? Yeah, and, and, and banks have been working hard to improve their capital ratios. Okay. which ironically I think has gone to the detriment of New Zealand because this is what's been taking place. Yeah, the banks get capital relief if they write a mortgage over a business loan. Yep. And the desire to make the banking sector more safer, the banks have actually gone out there and written a hell of a lot more mortgages. Yeah, so if you go back and have a look at five odd years ago, I think from memory, yeah, home lending was about 58% of total lending. Home lending is now 63% of total bank lending. So what we're seeing is that your banks have just flipped the switch. You know, let's write a mortgage as opposed to a business loan, and that's the way we're going to get our capital relief. So technically, we don't have to hold a dollar more of capital. We just get the capital relief by writing more mortgages. Ironically, where is this left New Zealand at the moment? We've got property metrics that are absolutely off the chart when you look at the valuations. And is that effectively another solution trying to find a problem? Because my recollection back then is, is there was a, a lot of discussion that banks were holding enough capital already. Uh, surely that's that, I suppose, if you combine that with the triple CFA, um, the the additional capital is trying to protect the banks from a downturn. We're now basically trying to you know protect borrowers from themselves. Um, is is you know another I suppose piece of regulation that didn't need to be there? Well, I wouldn't say it didn't need to be there. Look, I was working for a pretty big bank during the GFC. So, so the whole idea that the New Zealand banking sector walked through the GFC completely unscathed is not my recollection in regard to what actually went on. Yeah. And the New Zealand banking sector needed assistance to get through the GFC. So the spirit of what the Reserve Bank was bringing in, hey, let's have an additional insurance policy just in case we get this you know, horrible one in a hundred year event or, or whatever. But you know, I think there's some pretty sound logic behind we think banks need to hold more capital. We can argue how much more capital, right? but I think the Reserve Bank seriously misplaced what the unintended consequences of that policy would be or how banks were going to react. Because yep. all they did was that they shuffled the books. And, and ironically, that, that's led to a more unbalanced economy. Now, they're writing all the mortgage loans not realising that ultimately the service of mortgage, you need businesses out there. Yeah, 100%. I've got another question um, from an investor. Um, just in regards to rents, to what extent do you see uh, rents rising over the next couple of years like they have um, and what will be the biggest factor influencing this, i.e. incomes, um, of course, which are on the up, um, or landlord costs? Well, it'll be a combination of both. You can probably throw some government policy into that as well, along with the broader inflationary environment. But let's sit back and think about, yeah, look at some sort of equation in regard to what's driven house prices over a long period. So look at 2009 to 2019. If you break down what drove house prices, and the Reserve Bank's done this work, I can't remember which financial stability report it was in, but what the Reserve Bank basically worked out was that of a 90% increase in house prices over that period. A fair chunk was due to lower interest rates. A fair chunk was due to uh, increases in rents. So you justified the E within the equation. And what held back asset prices was declining inflation expectations. Now scroll forward from here, what have we got? Inflation expectations are gonna be up. So that's gonna be positive asset prices. Interest rates are up, that's negative house prices. Net on net, I think that overall is going to be a negative number. The property prices are going to hold up. It doesn't matter whether you're commercial or rents, you've got to get more E into the PE. 
Um, now, whether you, you, you just jam up the rents or you look at an intensification of the yield on the property, a big structural shift that needs to go on across New Zealand at the moment is a lot more attention to the E. Now, adding value into the projects as opposed to just sitting there and clipping the tickets. I, um, we've got a, another, another question here. Sounds all doom and gloom. What is working well for the New Zealand economy at the moment? Not all doom and gloom, it's just let's just acknowledge there's a cycle. Right? One of the reasons, you know, 3.2% unemployment is a sign of success. It's a sign of success that has a sting in its tail. Go out there, talk to any dairy farmer at the moment, and I don't think you'll be see too many of them sort of glum you know, about what's going on, where it looks like you know, they're going to see a, a 9 to $10 payout out there, and they've, they've paid down about $5 billion worth of debt in the last four, to four odd years. You know, there's some pockets out there that are that are swimming in, in cash. But you know, we do go through a cycle, and what tends to take place is when you go through a cycle, opportunities present themselves because there's always people that are more exposed at a certain end of the cycle. Now, ironically, as an investor at the moment myself, I'm quite looking forward to that because I've looked at the valuations over the past few years and I'm scratching my head and I think this is absolutely nuts. Well, there's nothing like a little bit of a, a tough time to sort of have a bit of a shake out, and I like that sort of environment. Best buying op buying opportunities come and come shortly. Is a um another question. What are your thoughts on debt erosion through inflation? Do you think investors, if they're well placed from a cash flow perspective, will benefit from um, an inflationary erosion of debt? Can you explain that a little? Yeah. Well, yeah. Works pretty well for government debt, which is why you know if governments around the globe are not too shy of a bit of inflation. Uh, the, the flip side to that is that you pay it through the interest rate cost. So you've got to think about the two channels. Now, as I said before, when interest rates went down and inflation expectations subsided, the net effect on house prices was overwhelmingly positive. Now, if I think about that in reverse going forward, you know, the impact of rising inflation expectations will be good for property prices because the cost of replacement builds is going up, so the value of the existing stock goes up but the interest rate effect is going to hit you on the other side. But inflation erodes debt. Um, in the, the chat rather than the Q&A, there's a question there. Um, Adrian Orr now has a dotted line report with Grant Robinson. How is this going to play out? And it does, well, he doesn't have a dotted line reporting to Grant Robinson. Yeah, can, that's, a, that's a bit of conjecture in regard to what can sort of go. They've, they've, they've got independence, but I don't even know it's, what it's, 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 what, it's what we call operational independence and of course you know, the, the reserve bank's been reined in a little bit by your housing has been could we say somewhat put into the agreement it's not a primary objective so their objectives are still about maximum sustainable employment and inflation at two percent or within the one to three percent policy band but your housing is now pretty clearly a, a consideration and it's a big consideration and the the Reserve Bank has repeatedly said, you know, don't look at us for driving up asset prices. Well, get real. You, know, you take interest rates down, you're going to take asset prices off to the off to the races, and that's what a large-scale asset program did as well. And I think they misread the tea leaves on the mood of the nation. Well, why why did they still implement on the, on that point at the back end of 2020, where the the market was already going nuts? Why did they still put the funding for lending program in? The funding for lending program, in my mind, is a crisis management tool. When banks have got insufficient liquidity, that's when you need a funding for lending program. Well, show me where the financial crisis was across the banks. Because what I saw in, re in regard to the asset and their liability positions is that banks were being flooded with deposits. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, 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 the term, so the, the savings and the transaction account balance is just absolutely rocketed up. Yeah, so there was no funding crisis. So we, you know, we, we had some tools that were being deployed, but why they were talking about negative interest rates is beyond me. It was interesting to see the RBA, but the RBA basically said, no, we're not going there. Whereas our central bank, oh, no, we think there's some potential for this, and they got the banks to go away and get operationally ready for negative interest rates. Well, what a waste of time. And we saw investors start to do their numbers on one and a half percent interest rates and stuff like this because of all the conjecture around, around you know, the OCR going negative. Yeah. People started going fantastic. We can get, 
you know, potentially mid-term money, you know, kind of under under two percent, and the pe pe people just went shopping on the back of it. Yeah, and yeah, it was. But the Reserve Bank was still talking a big game in regard to interest rates remaining low in May two thousand and twenty-one. Yep. Well, but by August, we're <laughs> we're off. I um I've got another one for for perhaps someone on the other side of the um of the ledger. What's your advice for someone who's buying their first home right now? Well, I can't provide financial advice. That's not within my my realm. But uh, but I can remember Bill, yeah, buying my first first home. It's a I viewed it as a long term investment decision. I wanted to get the right property. Yeah, trying to pick yeah the property cycles. Yeah, not that easy. You have a look at the mayor that the economists made of it in 2020. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I'd, you still put a bit of a risk management framework on a ride. Yeah, so I think there's going to be some opportunities present themselves in 2022. Uh, I think the key is to be cashed up and pretty flexible and, and pretty patient. Yeah, the, the stuff I'm seeing on the ground is that the market has turned and it's turned a lot faster than what the official statistics we've seen out of REI and Z up a train. Yeah, those statistics say the market's down about 1.5%. I'm seeing a market down far more than that. We're definitely yeah, seeing a lot more of a buyer's market than uh, what we had seen, and it's a lot, from our perspective, more in favour of buyers. They're not having to rush in and have the same FOMO that they had not too long ago. I think particularly in that first home buyer space. I think this might be the biggest buyer's market coming up since 2008, 2009, short, shortly. Um, it's, it's changing pretty pretty rapidly. Um, and we've got rising supply, shifting fundamentals, quite of credit, higher interest rates. We're hearing feedback from agents that are getting spot with listings, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, any final questions there, sorry, Ryan? Um, there are a few more, some of them more personal. I suppose one more, we'll wrap it up. Um, it's for our investors. How can they take advantage of the current economic environment? Um, you've got obviously high inflation, COVID, net migration outflows, high um, high employment, and also obviously what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. Well, in this environment, cash is king. If you balance, if you if you got the balance sheet, you become a hunter because there's always going to be some stuff that pops out at the tail end of the cycle. Yeah, so it's about yeah being pretty patient. It's not just the residential market. Yeah, we are seeing very clearly at the moment commercial property yields are starting to adjust up because they got forced down to unsustainable levels. You turn up the risk-free rate, the whole buying equation shifts in regard to where your cap rate needs to be to justify that investment. Yeah, so it's, so it's across the board in regard to what we're seeing, and yeah, that provides unique opportunities for people who have yeah, got the balance sheet capability to jump in and, and get stuff at the at the right price. Yeah, a lot of people have been really frustrated at what's gone on in the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Yeah, it's been great for some that have sort of last rode that last sort of leg if you if you manage to exit in time. But yeah, conversely if you're a long term investor you're prepared to ride the ups and the sort of downs and you put it in the back pocket. You wouldn't be worrying about it too much. I'd agree with that. I think that's a fantastic way to, to wrap things up. Um, a huge thank you to, to, uh, to you, Cameron, from both of us and from uh, everyone listening. Um, is there anything you want to say, I suppose, about bagger economics and kind of what you offer there in case there's anyone with businesses or, or, or anything there that, that could use your services? Uh, look, the stuff I do tends to be pretty tailored. So I thought about running a subscription based thing, but the problem with the subscription based thing is that you've got to cater for everybody and not everybody wants the same thing. Yeah, yeah so the, the stuff that I do is is very boutique in regard to what takes place because I think that's where the value added proposition is. Um, some of the stuff I do within the, the property market, I've got this, the people read the Bluestone property market report yeah. that, and develop that property cycle indicator. That sort of stuff is really interesting in regard to putting stuff a little bit differently out in the market, you know, as opposed to the generic stuff that you that you tend to see. Uh, everybody knows my style. I tend to play with a bit of a straight bat in regard to what's what's going on. Uh, definitely. Well, thank you very much for, for your time tonight. 
uh, we'll definitely look, look forward to having you on again in the future as well. Uh, all the best and apologies for the technology stuff up front. I don't, I don't know what the hell went, went wrong. I think that could have been an hour in, mate, not yours. So thank you so much for your patience with that. Cool. Thank you, mate, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Cool. Thanks again, Cameron. Cheers, guys. Bye. Well, what a great session that was, guys. Um, awesome information shared there by Cameron, Chris, um, and Ryan. Um, so I hope that you found that um, of some value. Um, there was a lot of information in there, um, and I'm sure that you will have taken something from that that will help you out um, with your um, property dealings moving forward. Um, so, all right, thanks very much to Cameron, um, Chris, and Ryan for um, making this interview happen. Um, and I look forward to talking to all of you guys again soon.